Hello. I wanted to give this talk that I gave as part of a lecture in Chris Manning's Stanford NLP class. I meant to re-give this talk sooner because I try to re-give all these talks that I give in private. Um, ultimately, this is on a paper by Hamish Iveson. Hope I pronounced that right on kind of comparing DPO from PPO. You can Google the title from here on the screen or I'll be in the description. Essentially, the goal of this project is kind of like more white rice research that Allen NLP is, or AI2 is trying to specialize in right now, which is try to answer the really basic questions for how to build a recipe that people can reuse in um, this kind of open ecosystem. This one was really digging in on trying to understand the differences between DPO and PPO and how do we actually get better models with PPO, which is what we know all the closed labs are doing, but we're not really able to replicate in the open. So hopefully this kind of gives you a taste of what this research looks like. And I have a list of things that I think we obviously need to do next if we're serious about doing better post-training in the open. I think post-training is something we could easily be matching models on, but we're not really. And we just need to coordinate a bit better. So we're going to talk about the steps we take to try to use PPO well. I'm going to break down where the potential gains from PPO are. We hear a lot about data. We hear about a lot about bigger reward models and related things, and then kind of conclude with hypotheses on what we need to do to do post-training and reinforcement learning from human feedback, sort of like Meta and Google with these Gemma and Llama 3 models. So here's what we're trying to answer. Is PPO better than DPO? And what we're going to do is we're going to start with a supervised fine-tuned instruction-tuned model. I've talked about this model a few times before, this 2 loo 2 13 b model is based on Llama 2 13b. It's a large and diverse, mostly synthetic supervised fine tuning data set. It's things like Code Alpaca, Lima, um, Share GPT, Chain of Thought from the Flan collection, a lot of things that we're pretty used to. This is a model we released last fall. It was one of the first models that we scaled DPO to 70 billion parameters on. This is a pretty OG data set on SFT. On the right side throughout this, you can see our evaluation suite. We kind of have these things where we have different breakdowns where this is averages across various tasks. Um, the specifics aren't too important in this. I think you can see on the right, alpaca eval reasoning, and there's things like GSM, grade school math, and reasoning, big bench hard, um, MMLU is in factuality. We can kind of go on. You can see this on the left. I didn't remember that I had that on the screen. but. What we're going to do is we're going to take this SFT data set and you add DPO to it. You can see that we're using this the oldest of the old preference data, which is this anthropic RLHF data. If you do this, DPO does actually improve your model on average, mostly on truthfulness, on alpaca eval. It's, it's, it's important to know that DPO does really do something. At the start, this is human data. It's pretty generally accepted that this data is noisy and people haven't made amazing models out of it. So then what to do after this is the normal thing, which is you switch to ultra feedback. Ultra feedback is the data set that was behind Zephyr, this kind of first DPO model to catch off. We still don't really know why Zephyr is such a strong data set. I talked about this on Interconnects recently on my blog post on frontiers and synthetic data. There's two hypotheses that one is that ultra feedback is really easy to use because there's a diversity of models generations within it. So that makes it so you can fine tune many different base models on this ultra feedback data and get strong performance. Another one is that the prompts are just good and it's actually a really good data. We don't really know where the performance comes from. It's still the best data set for fine tuning models almost a year after Zephyr and these two Lutu models, which is really shocking for me. Um, we need to have more preference data and I'll get to that um, later on. But again, you can see here, Ultra feedback gains a lot over this yellow, which is the anthropic HH, mostly in chat and alpaca eval and truthfulness. So it's not 100% clear what these actually mean, but it's it does perform better across a ton of different evaluations. And we haven't had people do the work on why ultra feedback is that much better. Um, I think that it's just something with the generations of open AI outputs to be pretty close to what these evaluations are. This is really important things happens is like, how do we switch from DPO to PPO land? Um, so when we switch to PPO, this implementation is in JAX made by the grad students. And we use the same ultra feedback data set. So this is the same base instruction tune model. And now we're adding PPO with the same data set. We just see bigger jumps than we did with DPO, especially in Alpaca Val. These, long, these PPO models are extremely verbose. When you talk to them in a demo, they're kind of unhinged. They don't seem that good. 
but it's not just alpaca eval that goes up. This is probably the big one of the bigger jumps in the so you get this one to two percent improvement again. Looking at the right side is where these average metrics are. And then the next question is that we hear in a lot of papers is can you use a bigger reward model to be a better reward signal for these um actual PPO downstream training? And this is something that I actually thought would be highly likely to work. I think that. I've been championing it, championing it a lot. We've heard about this in the Gemma report. Llama has hinted at this. Other closed models have hinted at this. But the thing is, uh, Nematron is a recent one from NVIDIA. But the thing is, some of the original um, RLHF works, like in StructGPT, actually said that you don't need a bigger reward model. So in this case, we went from a 13B reward model to a 70B reward model, both Llama-based with the same F SFT checkpoint. And we got a bit of bump in reasoning, but we didn't get co like bumps across the board in our RLHF training. And it's just unclear. And this is a big part of the story. And from here, we are kind of questioning, maybe if we're using a bigger reward model, we need to have data that challenges the reward model a lot. I think this is the right line of thinking where every change you need to make to your process should be accompanied by data changes. We tend to not think like that in the open because it makes the recipes very confusing. But that's the next thing we do is we tried to add more prompts to the to this data set. You could see here on this table where we have ultra ultra feedback reward model and then mixed reward model, which is we're trying to add extra prompts for code and reasoning to make the reward models better and make them better at extracting performance when you scale them up. What you can do is we can run all of our evaluations with the reward with multiple generations and having the reward models be best event sampling. You can see that there is a big jump with the reward models and best event sampling. So there is some general signal in these reward models and the 70B models are doing better, um, but that can't necessarily translate to downstream performance. We also tested these on reward bench, the evaluation for reward models and the trends are not that clear. So I think in this work, we definitely have a lot more to learn about how to train reward models. Reward bench isn't perfect, but the best event column here is pretty clear that you get a five to eight point bump, five to 10 point bump by doing best event on this reward model. So we should be able to use this, but we don't actually do much right now. So here's the last thing where we add more prompts. This is the last line. We tried to use this and show that the reward models are different. It did give us a much better alpaca eval score, but you can actually see a regression in the cumulative evaluations. So this is a bit of a head scratcher. It's like we do the simple things, which is switching, switching to PPO, but we're not able to do the kind of next step, which is making our RLHF pipeline more complex and more advanced and bringing in more pieces, which we really need to do. And that's the biggest thing that I think is different between these models that we're training in the kind of academic setting versus the ChatGPTs, the Llamas, the Geminis of the world. When making this PPO run work, there was always kind of the vibe of that we need one more thing to ablate, whether it's batch sizes, throughput, mini batches, whatever, um, data sets, where there's a lot of moving pieces and the infrastructure out there for open RLHF is really in its early days where there's not in that much of a improve enhanced generation speed. I think open RLHF now on PyTorch uses VLLM, which can make experimentation speed much faster, but on TPUs, we don't have something like that. So most of the experiment time in PPO is generating the completions before they're ranked by the reward model. And that takes a lot of time. We're, we don't have clear ways to further exploit PPO's gains. It's just changing to this setting does show that it's a bit better. But in recent experiments on top of Olmo, it's actually hard to reproduce. So in recent experiments on Olmo and Llama 3, we haven't actually shown that PPO is better. It seems to be that we need to go through all these data ablations, all these hyperparameter ablations one more time, and we haven't had the time for that. So every time we change the model, we have to take a step back and go to DPO, which is likely related to this ultra feedback data set just being really well suited to DPO. Um, you can see the data set here, or the code base here, um, fitting a 70 billion parameter policy and model is really hard, which is why we didn't release those. But we want to replicate these results in PyTorch, especially when it comes to the OMO models. Um, we did a lot of data ablations here. Here's the DPO checkpoints. What is remarkable is that when you're kind of changing these, the variations are pretty small. One, some that might interest people are that these kind of chatbot arena 
scores are fairly low. So training training on the outputs from the models and the user generations there are some of the lower scores, especially in safety. We've we've expected chatbot arena users prefer unsafe responses, and that's kind of what you're seeing here. Um, synthetic data sets are on average doing better than the human data sets. Help tier one was one of the stronger ones. So hopefully help tier two will do even better. We haven't added that in. Um, and here's the Delta where we kind of show that on a, our, our top data sets, these PPO models are always doing like half a point to one point better when we're doing this across the hyperparameters. You see this in the last column here. So it seems like when we do a little bit of tweaking, the PPO models are just coming out better and that's not the end of the story. What I'm really interested in is like, how do we do our like Jeff, like Meta does with Llama 3 in the blog post for Llama 3. And we're going to hear more about it this week with the 405B parameter model. They do iterative data collection. They're likely working with a vendor and getting timelines. They do some sort of, and then there's like this line where they use rejection sampling, DPO, PPO all at once. I'm thinking what they're doing is they apply one method, they collect new data, they apply another method, they collect new data, and they keep going iteratively. And that's kind of shaping the distribution. And they're they're trying each method at each step. And whatever one improves the various steps the most each time is what they use. So they probably get a batch of data, they try rejection sampling, DPO, and PPO, and then they proceed to the next batch of data. This is really unlike what we are doing in this kind of open ecosystem. Um, we're not scaling our RLHF pipelines and preference data sets like they are. We have these static things and we're tweaking a bunch of knobs and we're seeing how much we can get out of the data. But it seems like the closed labs are really focused on continuing to push their data. Like the data is the focus more than the model. And the better they make their data, the downstream aligned model gets even better. So we don't even have simple baselines like rejection sampling, which was the kind of surprising star of the show in Llama 2. And it's continued to be used in Llama 3, Nematron 340B, and others. So we really have to add these baselines. We have to work on better collaboration and functional tools and stop reproducing everything a million times. We need to have better benchmarks than alpaca eval. I think especially we're seeing Chatbot Arena be tuned to the closed models where they can kind of A-B test on it before release and get extra data and all these things. So we really need to keep building evaluations that are useful for these models and start spending more time on the RL stage where most of our data sets are for supervised fine tuning. But I think most of the gains from um, closed labs come in the RL stage where they're in incorporating complex multi-stage reasoning, process reward models, QSTAR, and the like. So we really need to start thinking about this RL code, this RL infrastructure, this RL data, and making the SFT a bit more of a standard thing because people know how to do that. We're saturating on performance and start unlocking kind of these new breakthrough open models. So hope we can do this. Please reach out if you have questions and want to help. Um, data is evergreen work. It's pretty easy to succeed. If you sit there and you stare at it, you'll make something cool. So send me your data sets, um, keep working on PPO and have a great day.